بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين. Good morning, guys and gentlemen. I would like to thank the organizing committee for the kind of invitation. I think what we're going to relieve you now from the statistics and the figures that is Dr. Maad Al Malah showed us. So I hope will be a refreshment for you. Now, why I think the organizing committee chose this topic is because it's a common thing that is we see in our daily practice. As you see, the annual complication is varied between different studies between 7 to 11 percent. So it's quite frequent. And what's more than that, the mortality. The mortality is varied between 0.8 to 1.5 percent. Now, 40 percent, 42 percent of this is cardiac. <coughs> now, I'm going to cover quickly the European guidelines, and uh, I'm going to discuss the role of the beta blocker in the preoperative stage. Uh, and I'm going also to have a few slides on the American College of Cardiology guideline, and I'll give you what, um, the way I look to these uh, different guidelines. Uh, the pathophysiology of preoperative myocardial infarction, as you know, there is increased risk of black uh, rupture and thrombus formation due to different factors, like uh, the stress of the surgical, the hypercoagulable state, the hemodynamic effect, and the phasospasm, fibrinolytic activity, and platelet activation. And of course, we have the sustained ischemia, that is uh, where we have a mismatch between the myocardial oxygen demand and uh, the stress that is we having during the surgery. Now, the European guideline focus on the multidisciplinary approach, which is, I think, is very essential. And uh, unfortunately, we don't uh, talk to much to each other. We just uh, drop a consultation notes, and the cardiologist can write his notes and walk away. Uh, I think we have to really to improve in this, because uh, in many instances, we can if avoid uh, our, which is our main goal in this preoperative assessment, is to avoid cancellation of a surgery. Uh, many people suffer a lot in order to get an access to the healthcare system, to find a bed, to get a surgical time. So I think we should not take that a light and just write two notes and uh, two lines of notes and uh, leave away. Uh, stepwise approach is uh, an essential concept in both guidelines. Uh, it's very important to, to recognize that is, is how urgent is the surgery. If it was as urgent surgery, then I think we should go with that clinical uh, focus. And the patient should really go to the OR and we have to try to assist him to minimize his risk factor. So we should try to minimize risk factor and not to say, okay, well, he have this percentage of mortality, let us cancel the OR. And then, if it was elective cardiac surgery, then we might consider the other thing, okay, what is his symptoms like? Is he an active cardiac condition or not? And if he have an active cardiac condition, then we need to treat it, and if it's not, then our next question, it is what's the risk of this surgical procedure? And this has been divided into low, intermediate, and high. And then if it was low, then we should allow the patient to go surgery, but if it was moderate or high, then we come the question of his functional capacity. We're going to go for this, so let's go to step number one. So urgent surgery, please allow him to go to the surgery, okay? His, prob his mortality from his dying uh, without treatment is much higher than the death which happened uh, with our intervention. If, if the surgery is not urgent, then okay, we'll move to the next step. Find what is his risk parameter. Does he have an unstable angina? Does he have an active heart failure? Does he have a symptomatic fall for heart disease? And again, remember it's symptomatic fall for heart disease and not only fall for heart disease. And if there is any recent myocardial infarction or recent myocardial injury. Now, if there is any of this active disease, then okay, you treat this and postpone the surgery. Uh, however, even in this situation, you have again to discuss with the surgeon and with anesthesia and when will be the best time to reschedule this surgery. Now, if this patient does not have these active or acute medical illnesses, then we look for the surgery, the surgery and what is the risk of this surgery. And as you see, it's in this table, the surgery has been divided into uh, three categories. The low risk, which is, has a mortality of less than 1%, the 
the intermediate one to five and, and high, which is more than five. And basically, to summarize, as you see, the 5% focus on the aortic surgery, focus on the surgery which has a major intra-abdominal fluid shift, and surgery which has involved the lung or transplant. Or the rest other surgery, either low or intermediate. The thing that frequently are consulted is, is that the majority of them are at low risk, breast, dental, endocrine, eye surgery, which is frequently have the consultation. If in carotid, which was, if it was asymptomatic, is different from carotid, which is, has symptoms. Gynecology, orthopedic, uh, especially the minor orthopedic surgery, all that are considered low risk, which does not need much of uh, intervention from a cardiologist. So uh, this is what I was referring to. So the major abdominal shift will, or aortic surgery will consider as a high risk uh, surgery. Now, if he has a low risk, which is less than 1%, then the recommendation is try to minimize his risk factor, but go directly for surgery. So there is no further investigation indicated for a low risk surgical procedure. Now, if we did the statistics in our number of the ECGs that is we are requesting in the government and in the private hospital, I am sure you will be surprised with the number of these figures. And if we have the system of billing of this ECG, I'm sure we're going to lose a lot of money. So if an assembly ECG is not indicated in such patient, now, if it was an intermediate or high-risk surgical procedure, then we move to step four, which is the functional capacity. Functional capacity is assessed by MET, so it's four to four, one to four, four to 10, and more than 10. If you are more than 10, which I think majority of the people who are sitting here don't have it, you can go for any surgery. You don't need further assessment. If you are four to 10, like climbing two stairs, that is you walk, uh, do you walk around the house, scrubbing, playing tennis, then again, you look for other parameters. While if you uh, have a low functional capacity, then in this case, you need further investigation. And that is our role of cardiologists to request the appropriate investigation. So good for a more, again, just try to minimize you work like as if class A, class one, a class, class A and class B in heart failure. So if it's statin indicated to start, start S inhibitor if it's indicated, and all these are class 2A. For example, starting SA and people have uh, uh, signs of systolic dysfunction. But overall, there is no investigation, and again, surgery directly. Now, if your functional capacity is moderate or poor, then we go to step five. And step five, again, is tell you what is the risk of the surgery in the table that is we, we mentioned. So it was an intermediate risk surgery. Again, modification of the risk factor, surgery, no investigation in the middle. Now, if there is a high risk surgery, then okay, then we'll let's spend some money, but again, look to some clinical risk factor which this patient had, like ischemic heart disease, heart failure, stroke or TIA, renal dysfunction, or diabetes mellitus. In that case, we might uh, go uh, for further investigation. Now, even here, we are taking these five risk factors and see how many of them we have. It was less than two, then we can do rest echocardiography and biochemical markers will be class 2B, 2B, okay? And then you can go for surgery, so really minimal investigation. Now, if the risk was more than three, then we might go for cardiac stress. And in the cardiac stress, again, what we do in the normal patient who are not going to the surgery, if there was extensive ischemia, if there was extensive ischemia, then you uh, uh, proceed for further uh, intervention like chronoangiography and revascularization. While if it was no or moderate ischemia, then there is no intervention needed, so we just go for surgery. 
Uh, so if there is extensive cardiac ischemia, it's we manage it like as if this patient is not going to the OR. So you either you revascularize by doing balloon angioplasty, barometer stent, uh, drug looting stent, and of course this again have to be with discussion with the surgical team because we see how urgent is the sur how urgent we need to the surgery, and sometimes we have many to loot, uh, to uh, uh, coronary artery bypass surgery. So there is nothing called prophylactic revascularization except if it's dedicated by the patient's symptoms. So if have brief, as there is a performance of myocardial revascularization is recommended according to the applicable guideline of management, applicable guideline of management of stable coronary artery disease. So nothing, surgery is not mentioned here. Late revascularization after successful non-cardiac surgery should be considered in according with the East European Society guideline on stable coronary artery disease. And just to like to draw to the last line, which is routine prophylactic myocardial revascularization, routine revascularization before low and intermediate risk surgery in patients with a proof in ischemic heart disease, proof in ischemic heart disease is not recommended, class three. So the recommendation for the aspirin of use, they said continuous aspirin is briefest retreated, uh, is, should be considered in the preoperative period and class 2B, uh, unless the risk of the bleeding is higher than the risk of the thrombosis. Uh, discontinuation should be considered in a patient in whom hemostasis is anticipated to be difficult, so the bleeding risk is, is high on him. And we can only get this information if we know the detail of the surgery from our surgical colleague. Borofractic statin use is recommended only if you're going for vascular surgery. So people are going for vascular surgery and just should ideally should be done two weeks before surgery. So this is summarize what we cover in a different way and uh, I hope we didn't reach to this. So beta blocker, now there is different studies which has been done on beta blocker in the preoperative period. And as you see, it's only two studies which has been proven to be significant, while the rest, there was no significant difference. Uh, again, it is showing you the number of uh, the patient who has been involved in uh, these different studies. And what was the recommendation? That is the preoperative continuation of beta blocker is recommended in patient who is currently receiving this medication. The initiation, the initiation may be considered for high risk surgery or people who have two clinical risk factors which we mentioned, diabetes, renal, stroke, TIA, or ischemic angina, or by anesthetic classification status more than three. Uh, again, beta blocker initiation may be considered in patient or, or known to have myocardial ischemic heart disease, while, while patient who has low risk, the initiation of beta blocker is not recommended. And even if we started a beta blocker, we should not start at high dose. Now, the type of the anesthesia uh, is there is general consensus to allow the anesthetist to use the tab of the anesthesia they think is preferable. There is evidence has suggested, uh, a few studies has been done to suggest which tab of anesthesia. And uh, when we speak about epidural or, um, uh, we said always, we said that is from the studies before the application of the guidelines, which is the general anesthesia and epidural anesthesia did not differ significantly in their rate of the bioperative cardiac complication. And this was in randomized control trial, and the level of dense was A. The three studies which compare general anesthesia has been published, and one study showed no significant difference in the cardiac complication rate, but this was a, a retrospective study. While there is two other studies demonstrate lower incidence of MI in patients who receive regional or spinal anesthesia. Regional or spinal anesthesia. And these studies were, uh, one of them was systemic review of randomized control trial, and the second was meta-analysis. 
Uh, we move now to quickly to cover the American uh, College of Guidelines. And again, it was a step uh, approach. Uh, they focus, they give different classification on different uh, diseases, for example, in the far or heart disease. And they have, for example, recommendation in this case, they said that patient with clinically suspected moderate or great degree of alpha stenosis or regurgitation who should go under preoperative echocardiography if they certain indication. So if, so it's not routinely, if there was no prior echocardiography within one to two years, okay? Or if there is significant change in the clinical status. So again, we are directed with the clinical symptoms. And now, if there is any intervention, it's again, again, as based on the guidelines. So for people who meet the standard indication for far for intervention, whether replacement or repair, should be on the basis of symptoms and severity of the stenosis. And the surgery is not part of this uh, involvement in this uh, equation. They give different uh, class of indication for aortic stenosis, mitral stenosis, but all of these were all dependent on the symptoms. So if it was asymptomatic, then you can clear the patient for surgery and it is class 2A. And you only what you need is the hemodynamic monitoring. If it was mitral stenosis, again you do just the hemodynamic monitoring and it's reasonable if it was asymptomatic to clear him for surgery. They, they give the same thing for the aortic, mitric, aortic and mitral regurgitation. They give the class of the indication in case of uh, cardiac uh, implantable defibrillator. And uh, they recommend that is the team of the surgery communicate with the cardiac team. And of course, the standard thing, use the bipolar cautery, be away from the defibrillator, the same apply for your best maker. Uh, in the pulmonary vascular disease, again, they have different classification. They use a calculation of the risk factor to see your mace. Uh, in the functional activity, they use different marks. And, and for example, if you are bursted in sternus exercise, you're giving a score 7.5, and you can't clear for surgery. While low activity, like walking two blocks, you are giving uh, 2.75. A stepwise approach similar to the European uh, study of uh, cardiology. Again, all your intervention should be guide-based medical therapy, guideline-dependent medical intervention. Different level of indication. As in you see, there is no much difference from the European study of uh, cardiology guideline. And again, it's, it's different steps. That is, we already covered. This is another way of looking to it. And, uh, and as you see, there is no risk. Again, they're classifying the surgery, low risk, intermediate, and high risk. And they give a supplement on the different use of the drug, like, for example, they spoke about doing 12 lead ECG. And what will be interesting is with the fact that the missionary routine preoperative resting ECG, routine preoperative resting ECG is not useful for asymptomatic patient undergoing low risk surgical procedure, class three. And assessment of LP function by echo, routine, routine preoperative evaluation of LP function is not recommended, again, is class three. Myocardial ischemia and functional capacity, recommendation on when to do the cardiopulmonary exercise test may be considered for patient that going elevated risk procedure in home functional capacity. So again, the functional capacity is the reason for doing this test. Protein preoperative chronography is not recommended class three. Okay, I'll tell you the way I look to these guidelines. So again, different on the use of the statin, ACE inhibitor. Basically, it's a risk factor management approach the antiplatelets is a big topic that unfortunately I could not cover and we have also the NOAX, they put a separate uh, chapter for it. 
the recommendation for the anesthesia, the uh, nitroglycine is not recommended. I'll end up with my last slide. That is, the assessment of the preoperative is focused on the clinical parameter, clinical assessment, and risk management with minimal or no diagnostic investigation. The cancellation or the delay of surgery, if at all, is only based on the symptoms rather than the risk. Thank you very much.